three or four days now. We've had nothing but rain. Some storms came through. Uh, a couple of couple of tornadoes, from what I understand. Uh, one, I guess, that went through Chapel Hill area and then uh, Troop area as well. Uh, so uh, you keep those families uh, in prayer that uh, also uh, had, you know, deal with that stuff going through their property or whatever. Uh, this morning, what's that? Also the hail. Yes, the hail, hail damage. I saw a couple of pictures uh, that uh, you had sent out. That's a pretty good size hail. That's yeah. golf ball size. Like that. Big, big Aggie, steel Aggie. Yeah, <laughs> marble size hail. Uh, so uh, we didn't get anything over there in Troop as far as hail goes that I know of. Um, I don't know about White House, but I know of. Uh, P size. Uh, P size. P size. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really bad. Really bad. Really bad. So uh, I keep those uh, people that are having to deal with the insurance companies uh, to get their houses looked at, their vehicles looked at, and stuff. Because you know that uh, boy, when that hill comes down, so the car lots and yes, the car lots are tear, uh, just tore up. Some of the new cars they're having to deal with and everything. So uh, you know, keep. Uh, all those people having to deal with all that paperwork, you know, that, uh, you know, body man, he can do so much, but that paperwork is what drives you crazy. Especially if you, like Rick said, have a whole parking lot full of new cars you have to deal with. So. Yeah, there was one that said they had 96 cars that they lost. Oh, wow. 96 90, cars. <laughs> what was that, Ralph? So you get some deals there. Yeah, you definitely get some deals. Get some, uh, 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 actually, yeah. Be convertibles. <laughs> the real value of that vehicle. Huh? Well, this morning we are going to be in John, John chapter 5. I want to look at verses 1 through 9. Uh, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Uh, God has laid this on my heart uh, for the last couple of weeks. I got to got to looking and around and uh, and seeing the things going on and uh, around me in particular and, uh, and stuff that's going through my life and uh, some of my friends uh, in the military. You know, we uh, we met. Uh, we had an ordinance party not too long ago up in Fort Worth and uh, got to talk to some friends and people I hadn't seen in 15, 17 years and. Uh, I just, God just laid this on my heart, so I, I uh, started looking into it and everything, and it just uh, just seemed like the right thing to do this morning. So we're going to look at John chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to start reading there in verse 1. And it says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you this morning as your humble servant, Lord. I ask that you would just use me as a vessel, Lord, to uh, preach your word and that your word be fulfilled here this morning, Lord. I ask that you would just be with everybody here that, the, that came to church this morning, Lord. We ask that you be with those that are on our prayer list, Lord. You know that we have added many, and uh, we had a couple of praises this morning, Lord, and we thank you for all those. And, Lord, we thank you for the rain that we received, Lord, and uh, Lord, we ask that you would be with, uh, again, all those that are having to deal with uh, some of the destruction that the uh, ill damage has caused. Uh, Lord, we know that you can just uh, allow them to work through that, and uh, Lord, that every time they get frustrated and fill out that paperwork, Lord, just look towards you and you give them a little bit more patience. Lord, I ask that you would just uh, be with all those that are uh, our members here that are not here today, Lord. We know that you know what they're going through. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, be with our country, Lord, be with our military, our first responders. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, make it to where they would just make the right choices, Lord, to bring this country back to you, Lord. Lord, we uh, ask for a specific uh, prayer this morning, Lord, for those that are hurting, Lord, for those that are lost, Lord, that don't know you, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, um, 
put those under those people under conviction, Lord, so that they might know and find out and receive you as their Lord and Savior, Lord. Uh, that no, without you there are nothing, Lord. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, again, this morning, like I said, John chapter five, verse one, we're talking about uh, uh, Jesus at the pool of uh, Bethesda, okay, where he heals the paralytic man. It says, uh, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and, the, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, and so this feast, we don't know what feast this was, but uh, we think it might have been one of the three feasts that usually go on there, and that was probably either Pentecost uh, or, uh, let's see, it was either Pentecost or uh, Purim or Passover. Okay, now those were the three feasts uh, that uh, majority of the people there, uh, over 21, had to attend. Uh, so, okay, so Jesus went up there to this feast. All right, it says uh, now in uh, there in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate was a pool which in Hebrew is called Bethesda, and I uh, looked that word up in uh, in Hebrew and. Uh, Hebrew, the, the word Bethesda means uh, house of mercy or house of grace. Again, another, another uh, translation would have been house of outpouring. So this was a pool in a place where you had all these people uh, had assembled uh, and, the, and the name of the place was fitting because it was called the house of mercy. Or the house of grace. And we see that Jesus uh, went to this place. And how fitting for Jesus to go to a place. And all of us needing what? Mercy. All of us needing Jesus' mercy all the time. So we see that Jesus went there. Uh, and uh, in Jerusalem uh, during this time of feast. Uh, and... Uh, and it was in Jerusalem, and it was. It says by the sheep gate was a pool. Now the sheep gate was not like a like a big gate. It was more or less like a, a hole in the wall, uh, and it was located. Uh, the sheep gate was a small opening in the north wall of the city, and it was just west of the northeastern corner. So if you're looking at uh, Jerusalem, it was in the northeastern corner. Okay. And there was a small hole there that they would bring the sheep in, and they would bring them in to this pool, uh, which was supposed, supposedly had five porches. And what they would do is they would have the sheep come in, and they would wash them and get them ready for sacrifice. Okay? So this pool had two sections, an upper and a lower section. Okay? And I'm going to get to that here in a minute. But it says right here, it says, uh, Now, and there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate was a pool, which is called in Hebrew, but that's not having five porches. All right? And uh, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed. So these people were blind, lame, paralyzed, sick people. Can you imagine, you know, with the Bible, in the Bible, when we read the Bible, it talks about, a lot of times in the Bible, it talks about Jesus had a multitude of people following him, right? Well, multitude uh, is not, it's is not just one. Uh, we see in here that, like, hundreds of people, thousands of people had followed Jesus around, right? So, when we talk about a multitude of people laying Around these two pools, we're talking about a lot of sick people. Okay? A lot of sick people laying around this. They were paralyzed. Can you imagine that? You know, I mean, we get frustrated when we walk into a doctor's office and see four or five people sitting there waiting on the doctor. I mean, they had these two pools and there was probably hundreds of people laying around this pool, sick paralyzed, lame, some kind of inf informity, right? Uh, 
just waiting on what? The stirring of the water. Now we don't know if this was, I know in uh, some of your Bibles here it says uh, they don't have verse 4 in there. Who, whose Bible doesn't have verse 4? Raise your hand. All of ours do? Well, some of the Bibles don't have verse 4 in them. And the reason that is is because uh, in earlier translations, they, it was more or less probably a side note that they put in uh, later on. And that verse 4 says, because in verse 7, verse 4 is explained. So it says, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Okay? At a certain time, we're to believe that it was during a feast time. Alright? Now they had many other feasts there in Jerusalem other than just the Pentecost and Purim uh, and Passover. They had many other small feasts. So you can imagine that these people came from all over the place and were laying around these pools sitting there staring at the water. Right? So they could be the first one in to the pool because it says in Scripture that the first one in the pool would be the one that would be cured, right? It says, For an angel went down uh, at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Can you imagine <clears throat> all these hundreds of people sitting around these two, two pools waiting for the stirring of the water. Can you imagine the chaos once they saw the water moving? Can you imagine the chaos of having to get into that pool first so that you can be the one to jump up and down and say, I'm cured, I'm whole. The site itself actually was discovered in 1888 by K. Schick. The pool was excavated and it was approximately 131 yards in length, 55 yards in width, and approximately 43 to 49 feet deep. So you imagine these pools were big, but you got hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people laying around these pools. Gets pretty congested pretty quick, wouldn't it? How many of you went down to, when you were growing up, you went down to the city pool, you know, there in your town or whatever, you might have had a pool out there, uh, and you went down to swim, and one day you go there, and would be about four or five people there, and you had the diving boards all to yourself and stuff, and the whole be able to swim. And then there's other times when you went to the excuse me, pool and there was seemed like the whole town came that day. And it was just so congested. Well again the Bible tells us that a multitude of people were there. That means a lot of people. More than likely they were bumping into each other or they were laying on top of each other in order to watch for the stirring. Now, we don't know if it was an angel or if it was uh, the way these two pools sat was you had an upper pool and a lower pool. And the upper pool was to gather water. And then the water would come in through these aqueducts and then it would drain into the lower pool and fill up the lower pool. Alright, so they don't, they don't know if it was maybe um, you know, air bubbles uh, that could have been stirring up the water. Uh, but here in the Bible, it tells us that an angel came and would stir the water. I even read in a certain area, uh, I read in a couple of articles that I read about the Pool of Bethesda, said that it had, um, it was like red in color. The water was like a red in color and it might have had medicinal purposes because of the type of minerals and irons and stuff that was in the water. Uh, so, whatever was going on in those pools, uh, miracles were happening, you know. So we see here that 
these people were all gathered around these pools uh, waiting for an angel who came down at a certain time. And again, we think this was during the time of feast. And it says there in verse 5, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? Well, I don't know about you guys, but uh, don't you think that the, the paralyzed man laying beside the well, didn't you think his facial expression was kind of odd when Jesus asked him, you know, do you want to be made well? And here's the thing that really gets me is out of all these people that's laying around these two pools, Jesus picked that one man out of all, all of them. And he comes down and he sees this paralyzed man there and he walks up to him. And Jesus already knows that he's been there for, he's been coming to that pool for 38 years. He knows that this man has been in this condition for 38 years. And he asks him, Do you want to be made well? I think this was Jesus' way of asking the man, hey, do you just have a little bit of faith? There's times in our lives whenever we're in that position and we just want to be made well. But you notice that this man had hope in hopelessness. And the reason why I say that is the man had hope that he was going to be well or made well because he came there for 38 years. He came there to look and watch for the stirring of the water. So he had hope that maybe one day he might be able to get in that water before someone else. But he had hopeless, he was hopelessness because of the fact that he'd been there for 38 years and he'd never not once been able to get in there first. And the hopelessness came from the next verse right there. And the sick man answered him and, uh, and he said, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Hopelessness right there. Yet hope because he knew that if he could get there, he knew that he would be healed. But in all that hope, he also had hopelessness because he knew each time he tried to get into the water, someone was always faster. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you got that hope? That you're going to get that promotion? Or that you're going to get that car? Or that you're gonna build that house, or that <coughs> you're gonna be there for a friend, and something always comes up, and you never get to do it. I've been there many times. He simply gave the excuse: I have no one. To put me in the water before somebody else gets down there in it. <clears throat> and notice he said, sir. He said, sir. He didn't say Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was at that time. He says, the sick man answered him and said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. We see that the man obeyed Jesus. He's, that hope that he had, all those years, you look, you look back and you, you say, well, why didn't he just get up and get, 
Somebody else probably could have told him, hey, just pick your bed up, man. Just get on out of here. But there was something about Jesus when Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? And I can just see this man looking deep into Jesus' eyes. And he believed that because this man asked him that particular question at that particular moment in his life, at that particular time, at that particular place, that he would be well. Because Jesus said that he was going to be well. Take up your bed and walk. And the man did that. He didn't give an excuse. And notice that when the man picked up his bed and walked, he was, he was strong enough that he could actually pick up his bed. Now we're not talking about a bed like our big king size sleigh bed or something. Now we're not talking about a bed. We're talking about like a mat. Like a, like a bed roll or something. Okay, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a big bed made of wood or anything like that. But I'm sure if that was the case and Jesus told him to pick up your bed and walk, he, he would be able to pick up his bed and walk too. But now, there's other places here in the Bible uh, that I want to talk about too where unusual times have happened where people were healed too. Some were healed by a purified pot of stew in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 38 through 41 where it says and, Eli and Elisha returned to Gilgal and there was a famine in the land and now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him and he said to his servant put on a large pot of, and boil stew for the sons of, of the prophets so one went out into the field of to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it a lap full of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, Man of God, there is death in this pot. And they could not eat it. So he said, then bring some flour and put it in the pot. And, and he said, serve it to the people and they, that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. <clears throat> also, we know that there was uh, uh, Naaman. I don't know if any of you know the story of Naaman and leprosy. Okay. Uh, he was told to, to go wash himself in the Jordan. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10 through 14, said that Alyssa sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on me, uh, call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not Amma and the Prophar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage, and his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he says to wash and be clean, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. These are just a couple of other times where people were unusually healed by the word of God. Now I can just uh, see Naaman out there after he started seeing his skin starting to heal. I can just see him dipping himself in the Jordan. I mean, just as fast as he could go. Even though he thought the Jordan River was less than all the other rivers, right? But I can see as the Word of God started coming, uh, uh, 
you know, through, I can just see him dipping himself in that water just as fast as he can dip. But here we see uh, in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, we see what? We see the man of God, this, all these paralyzed people, all these lame people, all these sick people around these two pools, multitudes, hundreds, maybe thousands of people. And they were looking for Jesus Christ. To heal them. They were looking for the stirring of the water. Can you see? Christ was walking among them and they did not recognize him. They did not recognize the one they could just speak and say, You're healed. And every one of them could have been healed that day. But as scripture shows us, not one of them noticed him. He walked through all those paralyzed, all those lame, all those blind people. All those sick people and picked out one person. Not one person said, Hey, there's Jesus. I can be healed right now if I can just get to Jesus. Not one of them. But they were focused on the water. The stirring of the water. They weren't focused on Jesus Christ. They weren't focused on the only true one that can make them whole. I'm sure this water probably healed some of them. But nine times out of ten, it wasn't a full healing like Christ can give us. I know that uh, As I read in John chapter 5, verse 1 through 9, and then I started reading further into it, I know that uh, this goes on to just show how people really are. Because, you know, it goes into show where uh, the higher ups and the religious people were wanting to condemn Jesus for healing the paralytic man on the Sabbath. Because if, as we read a little bit further here, it says in and uh, verse nine, it says, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. It says the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath, if it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them. Who, he who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. But I want to go back to what I was uh, mentioned earlier. None of them, none of them had their eyes on Jesus. None of them had their eyes on Christ. They were looking for something else to make them better, to make them well. How many times do we fall into that category? That we look for something else to make us better instead of asking God, the creator of this world, our creator. You know, this morning, coming to church, I was telling Mary, I said, you know what? God must have been pretty tired after he made his creation. Because if you didn't think of it, every leaf is different from the, another leaf. Every butterfly is different from every butterfly. Every person is different from every other person. Each and every one of us have our own characteristics, our own certain things that God made us about Him and His own image. But we have to stay focused on Jesus Christ and not let other things lead us astray. We don't need to be like Jeremy. 
And I'll close this morning and tell you right now, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, talk to somebody. Reach out to another Christian. Those of you that are on, that are watching this online, uh, you know, the Lord is waiting for you. Don't wait on Him. You, tomorrow's not promised. Tomorrow's not promised. Don't wait on somebody to come to you. Go to them and tell them, hey, I need the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Don't look for another cure. Don't, don't look for another cure. Jesus is there for you. He wants a personal relationship between you and Him. It doesn't have to be you, Him, and your mom, you, dad, your brothers, your sisters. He wants that relationship between you and Him. That's right. That's right. So call on Him. He's waiting. Brother Ralph, if you'll come, lead us uh, in a song of invitation. Uh, we have our uh, mention down here. I'll, I'll pray with you. Brother Rick will pray with you. Uh, Brother Ralph, where we're going to be at this morning? 320. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You guys come down. The altars are open. If you want to come down and pray, I'll pray with you. Uh, those of you at home, you know, bow your heads. And, uh, get right with the Lord today. Tomorrow's going to be too late. It'll be too late for you. Get right with Him today. He loves you. He, he wants you to come to Him and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. That's right. Oh, so are you weary and proud, and the light in the darkness you see, there's light on a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free.